Welcome to my last video in my series about Dad's Army. My previous videos have focused on three specific actors and their characters. Clive Dunn, Lance Corporal Jones, Arnold Ridley, Private Godfrey, and John Laurie, Private Fraser. And links to those videos are below in the description. Now it's time to look at the rest of the platoon, and in particular, their real wartime roles. Of the core seven members of the Warmington-on-Sea Home Guard platoon, five served their country in uniform during World War II. Two were officers, one was a sergeant major, and one was a prisoner of war. Two of them had also served in the First World War. And of the wider Dad's Army team, one made parts for Spitfires, one was in the Army of Occupation in Japan, and one flew in Lancaster bombers. This is the story of the real wartime service of the Dad's Army cast, and its writers too. Now, whilst you might expect me to start my story with the commander of the platoon, Captain Mannering, played by Arthur Lowe, I'm actually going to begin with his second in command, Sergeant Wilson, played by John Le Mesure. In Dad's Army, Sergeant Wilson is the terribly nice and well-heeled second in command of the unit. His character always seems bemused by the whole army thing and, rather than shouting orders, tends to try and organise the men with comments like, you know, would you mind awfully? <laughs> In many ways, this slightly casual view of soldiering mirrors Le Mesure's own conduct during the war, as you're going to find out in a moment. In the very last episode of the show, he attends Lance Corporal Jones's wedding in his First World War uniform, displaying the rank of captain, much to Mannering's dismay, as he had only been a lieutenant. Obviously, this is fiction, but interestingly, in real life, John Le Mesure really did rise to the rank of captain, although in the Second World War. Rather like his fictional character, he did come from a well-off family, and as a teenager, attended a boarding school, Sherborne School, where one of his contemporaries was the future mathematician and computer scientist, Alan Turing. Unlike the future computer scientist, Le Mesure hated school and couldn't wait to get out of academia. Balking at the legal career organised by his father, he decided that his was a career in acting. In 1933, aged 21, he joined the Fay Compton Studio for Dramatic Art in London. One of John's fellow students was a certain Alec Guinness. The two struck up a friendship that was to last the rest of their lives. And in their passing out review in 1934, Guinness pipped him to the top prize. For the rest of the 1930s, Le Mesure worked in rep theatre, although in 1938 he made his very first television appearance in a BBC play, The Marvellous History of St Bernard. The outbreak of the war saw him back in London acting at the Brixton Theatre, which was part-owned by his then father-in-law. Unlike in the First World War, where the government had called for volunteers and men had rushed to enlist, the Second World War was, in many respects, slightly more downbeat and organised. The Conscription National Service Armed Forces Act passed by Parliament on the very day that war was declared meant that rather than that mad rush to enlist, British men aged 18 to 41 patiently waited for their turn to be called up. And in 1939, the priority was on young men aged 20 to 23, meaning that the 28-year-old Le Mesure was somewhere down the line. So in the meantime, he carried on with business as usual, acting, whilst volunteering as an air raid warden in London. In September 1940, he returned home to his rented accommodation in Brixton, only to find it destroyed by a German air raid. During the same raid, the theatre where he was working was also bombed. If the theatre being put out of action wasn't bad enough, Le Mesure realised that his call-up papers were inside the now demolished house. Without those papers to hand, he couldn't recall his actual call-up date, or exactly where he should be reporting. All he could vaguely recall was that it was somewhere near Tidworth in Wiltshire. When his inquiries at his local recruiting office were met with blank faces, he felt there was nothing to do but set off towards Salisbury Plain and hope for the best. <laughs> Are you starting to wonder if he didn't have to try hard to act in his role as Sergeant Wilson? Well, you might as the rest of the story unfolds. John Le Mesure arrived by taxi at the Royal Armoured Corps training base at Tidworth. As the newest recruit walked towards the main gate, you can almost imagine the thoughts of the duty sergeant 
as he surveyed the actor approaching, complete with his set of golf clubs. Things went from bad to worse. One night, whilst on guard duty, an officer accompanied by a sergeant inspected him. As part of the drill, he had to present his rifle and realised, somewhat amazingly, he'd forgotten to put the bolt on his rifle. In other words, he was on sentry duty with a rifle that couldn't fire. Realising that he was in serious trouble, Le Mesurier called upon his finest acting skills and mimed the action of opening and closing the bolt in the darkness. <laughs> and if you think that this was British comedy at its best, there's more, because the officer seemed to actually be taken in by it. But not the sergeant. As a punishment, the actor turned soldier was confined to barracks. Although the sergeant probably wished he wasn't anywhere near the barracks at all when I tell you what happened next. As a mechanical unit, recruits were expected to learn how to ride a motorcycle. Le Mesurier proceeded to lose control of the vehicle and managed to jump off just as it smashed into a brick wall. For those of you with good memories, you might recall that as Sergeant Wilson, he was to repeat this antic in the Dad's Army episode entitled The Honourable Man. By now, the NCOs had got the measure of their new recruit. Posh, muddled, with not a mechanical brain in his head. What could they do with him? His sergeant Riley told him his only option was to try to become an officer. With their encouraging remark that he'd better not come back, Le Mesure was sent off to an officer assessment centre. And in June 1941, he was commissioned in the Royal Tank Corps. By 1943, he'd been posted to India. He was based at Ahmadnagar, which to this day is the home of the Indian Army Armoured Corps. It was incidentally also the birthplace in 1918 of Terence Allen Milligan, better known to history as Spike Milligan. Whilst victory in Europe was fast approaching, the war with Japan seemed to be lasting forever. We forget just how many British servicemen spent their war years in India and Burma, alongside over a million Indian servicemen. In fact, apart from Le Mesurier, three other men closely associated with Dad's army served out there during the Second World War, as you're going to find out in a while. As the war progressed, Le Mesurier was promoted to the rank of captain and posted to the northwest frontier, the mountainous frontier region dividing British India from Afghanistan. Here, his map reading skills, or as he freely admitted, his lack of them, resulted in his unit getting lost on more than one occasion. And then his piece de resistance was managing to get two tanks stuck in the rocky terrain. John Le Mesurier's military service ended upon the surrender of the Japanese. The only shots he'd heard in anger were from Patan tribesmen on the northwest frontier who took pot shots at his armoured vehicles. En route back to England to resume his acting career, he passed through a transit camp in India. It was here that there was almost a sliding door moment in the history of Dad's army. But that is for later in the story, so keep with me. His post-war career saw him acting alongside some of the greats in British cinema, including Peter Sellers, Richard Attenborough and Dame Margaret Rutherford, and TV appearances with comedian Tony Hancock. In 1968, he was persuaded to join a new BBC comedy show, Dad's Army. Unsure how to play his role of Sergeant Wilson, he asked the writer Jimmy Perry for advice. And Perry suggested that Le Mesurier made the role his own. And so, as he later said, he based Sergeant Wilson's approach to soldiering very much as he himself had during World War II. The result? A brilliant comic foil to his pompous commander of the Warmington-on-Sea Home Guard platoon, Captain Mannering. And speaking of Captain Mannering, it's time to move on to Arthur Lowe. Born in Derbyshire in 1915, Lowe was brought up in Manchester. Poor eyesight put pay to his early ambitions of joining the Merchant Navy, and he ended up working at an aircraft factory. Early in 1939, he joined the Duke of Lancaster's own yeomanry, a regiment in the Territorial Army, the British Army Reserves. Consequently, when the Second World War broke out in September 1939, he was immediately called up. Once more, his poor eyesight intervened and Lowe was transferred to the Royal Ordnance Corps, where he served on searchlight duties in Lincolnshire and then in South West Wales. In 1942, he was posted to Egypt, 
where he transferred to the newly established Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, RIMI. For Lowe, however, there was no excitement of the Battle of El Alamein or chasing Rommel's forces out of Africa. Oh no. He ended up at the 15th Radio Repair Workshops in Rafa, which is now in the Gaza Strip. To alleviate, as he recounted, the, quote, sheer bloody boredom, unquote, he set up a dramatic society for the troops. Now in his late twenties, he had finally found his calling. So good were his comic acting skills that he was posted to a field entertainment unit where he finished the war, having attained the rank of Sergeant Major. Upon demobilisation, Lowe embarked on an acting career for the rest of his life. By the time he was cast as the commanding officer of the Home Guard platoon in Dad's Army, he was already well known on television. Many people have forgotten, or indeed never knew, that he was in the original cast of the soap opera Coronation Street, where he played Leonard Swindley for five years. Of the seven core members of the platoon in Dad's Army, two were veterans of the First World War and wore uniform again in the second. Arnold Ridley, Private Godfrey, and John Laurie, Private Fraser. As I said earlier, I have made videos telling their stories, so I won't repeat it all here. There's links in the description below. However, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge how they served their country in World War II. Arnold Ridley, who played Private Godfrey, although injured, had survived the Battle of the Somme in the First World War. At the outbreak of the Second World War, he had once again volunteered for action. Now in his 40s, he was commissioned as an intelligence officer. Given the temporary rank of major, he was responsible for escorting journalists around the front's line in 1939 and 1940, before the German Blitzkrieg. When that lightning German assault did come, Ridley, like the rest of the British Expeditionary Force, fell back on the coast. He found a place on the last vessel evacuating troops from the port of Boulogne, but the aerial bombardment and shelling had brought back memories of the Battle of the Somme what we would now recognise as PTSD. He was discharged in June 1940 and served the rest of the war in both the real Home Guard and with ENSA, the force's entertainment organisation. Meanwhile, John Laurie, Private Fraser, had also survived the horrors of the Western Front during the First World War, in his case, the Battle of Passchendaele. Afterwards, he had embarked upon a highly successful acting career during the 1920s and 30s. In his 40s, by the time the Second World War broke out, he was beyond conscription age and, like Ridley, served in the Home Guard. He wasn't the only person associated with Dad's army to serve in the real Home Guard during the war. That's coming up in a while. And interestingly, despite the show beginning half a century after World War I, Laurie and Ridley were not the only great war veterans involved in the show either. A peripheral character in Dad's Army, Sidney Blewett, was played by Harold Bennett, who had served as both a horse and motorcycle courier in the 1914-18 conflict. Harold Bennett would go on in the 1970s to play young Mr Grace in the comedy Are You Being Served? Even when the show started, Ridley, Laurie and Bennett were already in their 70s. By the time the show ended, Arnold Ridley was 81. It may surprise you to know that Clive Dunn, who played the elderly, doddering and highly enthusiastic Lance Corporal Jones, was not as old as his character. Whilst in the shows, Jones was in his 70s. Clive Dunn was actually just 48 when he was cast in the role. Dunn, too, had served his country in the Second World War. Coming from a showbiz family, he was already on stage before the war. However, when the war broke out, he didn't wait for his call-up. He volunteered. Age 19, he joined the 4th Queen's Own Hussars. This old cavalry regiment had been formed way back in 1685 in response to the Monmouth Rebellion and the last major battle on English soil, the Battle of Sedgemoor. As an aside, maybe the Battle of Sedgemoor would be an interesting video talk. What do you think? Please drop me a comment below. Anyway, the 4th Queen's Own Hussars had fought in some of the most famous battles involving the British Army, including Dettingen, where George II was the last English or British monarch to personally lead their troops into battle, Talavera in the Napoleonic Wars, and the Charge of the Light Brigade. Winston Churchill was commissioned in the regiment in 1895. By the time of World War II, they'd swapped their horses for light tanks, 
and in 1941, Trooper Clive Dunn and the rest of the regiment found themselves in Greece, trying to fend off a joint German-Italian invasion. As the Germans swept through the country, capturing Athens, his regiment were ordered to form a rearguard at the Corinth Canal Bridge to enable the rest of the troops to be evacuated by sea. Despite gallant resistance at the bridge, the Germans were able to cross the canal elsewhere, making the Hussar's position untenable. 400 were captured. Young Clive Dunn was with a group of about 70 men who, hiring a local guide, were trying to reach the beaches from where they might be rescued. Despite arriving at the shoreline, they were captured too. He was to spend the next four years in prisoner of war camps in Austria. In an attempt to raise morale, Dunn would assist in putting on shows for the men. On one occasion, he visited the hut of a friend, Johnny McGeorge, to borrow a book of jokes that he could use on stage. Returning to his hut, he had covered about 20 yards before he was knocked over by an enormous explosion. When he pulled himself up, he realised that a stray US bomber had dropped its payload on the camp. The site of Jimmy McGeorge's hut was now a crater. Dunn spent the night digging through the rubble, looking for survivors and pulling out the dead. In all, 40 Allied prisoners died that night, including his friend. I always wonder whether his comical routines were some sort of therapy for what he'd witnessed that night. As Lance Corporal Jones in Dad's Army, he produced some of the great catchphrases such as permission to speak and they don't like it up em. He also used to regale the platoon with his various experiences, not least serving with Lord Kitchener against the Fuzzy Wuzzies as well as fighting on the northwest frontier in India and serving in the First World War. Another character in the show who reminisced about old glories was the commander of the neighbouring Eastgate platoon, Captain Square. His medal ribbons tell a similar story to the career of Jones, uh, Sudan, Boer War, India, First World War. And intriguingly, in that last conflict, he claims that he fought alongside Lawrence of Arabia. But unfortunately, he doesn't really elaborate, which is a shame because it would be a great story. Actually, Lawrence of Arabia would be a great story anyway. What do you think? Captain Square is played by Geoffrey Lumsden, an accomplished actor who enjoyed periods on Broadway. During the Second World War, Lumsden was another member of the Dad's Army team who served his country, in this case, against the Japanese in Burma. Of the core members of the cast, only Ian Lavender, Private Pike, and James Beck, Private Walker, didn't serve in the Second World War. Lavender was actually the only member of that core platoon to be born after the war. He's also the only member still alive. James Beck was only 10 when the war broke out, so missed any sort of call up. He was, however, called up for national service after the war, where he served as a fitness instructor. Upon leaving the army, he entered acting landing parts in Dixon of Doc Green, Z Cars and Coronation Street before becoming the Cockney Spiv, Joe Walker, in Dad's Army. Beck died of pancreatic cancer in 1973 and so was replaced in Series 7 by Welsh actor Taffrin Thomas, aka Private Cheeseman. Whilst not an original cast member, I do want to acknowledge Thomas's wartime service too. He was a rear gunner in a Lancaster bomber, and after several successful raids, his plane crashed, killing the whole crew except for him. And as a way of dealing with the trauma of the crash and the loss of his comrades, Thomas took up acting. He continued this after the war, landing a role in Under Milkwood, starring Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor and Peter O'Toole. Just for the record, another soldier who does appear in Dad's Army, with just a few speaking parts, is Private Sponge. Played by Colin Bean, he, like Beck, was too young to serve in the war, but was called up for national service and served with the British Commonwealth Occupation Force in Japan. This army, comprising men from the UK, Australian, New Zealand and Indian military, was based in Japan after the war, peaking at 40,000, about a third of the US force in the country. It would be remiss of me to talk about Dad's army without mentioning three notable but non-Home Guard characters in the show. Firstly, Captain Mannering's sparring partner, the ARP warden, Mr Hodges. Always out to try and get one over on the pompous bank manager turned Home Guard captain, Hodges was played by Bill Pertwee. 
Pertwee had left school during the war, hoping to join the RAF. His hopes, however, were dashed when he failed the medical, and so he spent the war in a factory, making parts for Spitfire cannon. The Home Guard in Dad's army are based in the church hall, something that's not particularly agreeable to the vicar, played by Frank Williams. Born in 1931, Williams was too young to serve in the war. However, that's not the case for his sidekick in the series, Edward Sinclair, who played Virgie Yateman. Sinclair served in the Second World War with the Oxford and Bucks Light Infantry. On the 6th of June 1944, the Ox and Bucks were part of the airborne glider landings in Normandy on D-Day. The 1st Battalion were later to again land by glider during Operation Market Garden, Arnhem, whilst the 2nd Battalion would participate in the Rhine crossings in 1945. But, due to a previous severe bout of bronchitis, Sinclair was not allowed to join either battalion in action. He was left back in Britain, and by the end of the war, he, like many of the Dad's Army cast, was performing in the Army concert parties. And that, you might think, brings us to the end. Except, it doesn't. Whilst that's the end of the cast's wartime stories, there are two remaining stories that must be told. Both writers of Dad's Army, Jimmy Perry and David Croft, served their country in the Second World War. And their experiences, especially those of Perry, are crucial to this much-loved comedy. Jimmy Perry, the son of an antique dealer, was a teenager in Watford, Hertfordshire, when the war broke out. He joined the 10th Battalion of the Hertfordshire Home Guard. And whilst there, he met an elderly member who would regale the platoon with stories about serving with Kitchener, fighting the Fuzzy Wuzzies in the Sudan. Ringing any bells? It was his experiences in the Home Guard that gave him the idea of Dad's Army in the 1960s. Lacking script writing experience, he joined forces with David Croft, who had already written several BBC sitcoms. Croft had also served in World War II. Initially in the Royal Artillery, he had eventually been commissioned in the Essex Regiment. With that regiment, he was posted to India. I told you a lot of servicemen went to India and Burma, didn't I? Croft rose to the rank of Major, making him the most senior ranked member of the Dad's Army team, seeing as Ridley had only been a temporary Major. Together with Jimmy Perry, David Croft helped write and direct all 80 episodes of Dad's Army, running from 1968 to 1977. Following his time in the Home Guard in Hertfordshire, Jimmy Perry was eventually called up. He joined the Royal Artillery, once again serving in India and Burma. To avoid the boredom that had affected Arthur Lowe in the Middle East, Perry joined the Royal Artillery Concert Party and eventually ended up in the Combined Services Entertainments. Croft and Perry would team up in the 1970s and draw on Jimmy Perry's experiences of those Royal Artillery Concert Parties in India and Burma. If you are old enough, I think you know which comedy I'm talking about. It ain't half hot, Mum. Just for the record, David Croft, with Jeremy Lloyd, wrote the first six series of another wartime-based sitcom, Allo Allo, whilst he and Jimmy Perry also penned Heidi High. It was in 1945, as part of the Combined Services Entertainments, that Jimmy Perry was posted to the transit camp at Diolali in India. Here they attempted to keep up the spirits of troops who were desperately waiting shipment home for demob after the war. They were fighting a bit of a losing battle. Many soldiers waiting there were heard to quip that they were not going to deal lally, but do lally with the boredom and the heat. A concert was quite frankly the last thing they needed in their lives. One soldier was so bored and frustrated, he quietly gave Perry's concert a miss. His name? John Le Mesurer. <laughs> and so now, I think we really have come full circle. An absolutely classic British comedy, which at its height was watched by 18 million viewers. That's in the days before you know, videos or catch-up TV. 18 million people tuned in to watch it in the moment. A series that's produced notable catchphrases and hilarious moments. Don't tell him, Pike. But actually... It pays tribute to well over a million men serving in their local Home Guard platoons who were willing to defend their little piece of Britain against a possible invader. <laughs>
And despite the comedy of Dad's army, the men who gave us so many laughs actually served to their country and were willing to put their lives on the line for it and their comrades too. A great show starring some great men. I hope you enjoyed that video and found it an interesting way to round off my series on Dad's Army. I've certainly had fun researching all the stories. And if you're enjoying my work, then please consider becoming a patron so I can research and produce even more videos for you. There's a link coming in a moment and there's also one in the description below. Thanks for your support, keep well, and I'll see you very soon.